Today we are on part four of a sermon series entitled Politics and the Kingdom of God. And today we're gonna focus on the important topic of biblical justice. And to learn about biblical justice, we're gonna look at Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is a psalm written from King David to his son, Solomon. And it's a royal psalm, a royal psalm written to an older aging father that had the privilege of seeing his son ascend to the throne. And he writes this psalm in the form of a prayer to his son of how he should reign and rule with righteousness and justice so that the nation of Israel would be prosperous and flourish. Psalm 72, beginning in verse one. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills and righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people Give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like grass that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Skip down to verse 12. For he delivers the needy when he calls the poor and him who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live, may gold of Sheba be given to him, may prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land on the tops of the mountain, may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon. May people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. And the grass withers and the flower fades. But know not the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. It's roughly 970 BC, and King David is old. And nearing the end of his life, a man that has written many things and experienced great success and experienced great failures. But one thing he had the privilege of doing was seeing his son, Solomon, ascend to the throne and be crowned as the new king of Israel. And so David takes this moment and he puts pen to paper and he writes Psalm 72 in the form of a prayer to his son Solomon. And the message is this, Solomon reign and rule with righteousness and justice and Israel will experience flourishing and prosperity. Over 2,000 years later, our world has been turned upside down. The nations are raging and people are searching for answers in the midst of brokenness and the church of Jesus Christ is asking the question, can justice ever be restored? Can righteousness once again be proclaimed at the city gates? In this fallen and broken world, is God's justice and righteousness even possible? You see, the longing for justice is not wrong. We've been created to long for it. We've been created in such a way in God's image that we recognize whether we're a Christian or not here this morning, that the world is not right, that the world is broken. And we long for someone or something to come to fix what is broken, to bring justice to injustice, to bring healing and hope to those areas of sin and evil in our nation. The question is how. The world and our nation are asking the question, how do we fix this broken world? And in particular, how do we fix this broken 
an upside down nation. The first thing I want us to see in this passage is the definition of biblical justice. Biblical justice defined. Justice in our American vernacular has become very popular over the past few years. And it's given rise to what is known as the modern social justice movement. And under the banner of the modern social justice movement, particularly in America, you have such things as economic justice, you have gender justice, racial justice, and in preparation for this sermon, I even discovered there's such thing called environmental justice. You can seek justice for about anything under the sun. The problem with all of these attempts towards justice is they're often vague and ill-defined. I don't think our nation has any earthly idea of what justice even means and how to define it. So I wanna give us two simple definitions as we have this discussion regarding justice. Justice is the alignment to a standard of righteousness or goodness. Justice is the alignment to a standard of righteousness or goodness. Now with that definition, this is biblical justice. Biblical justice is the alignment to the standard of God's righteousness. If justice is the alignment to the standard of righteousness, biblical justice is the alignment to the standard of God's righteousness. In fact, you can see it in verse one and two, that justice and righteousness are used interchangeably. All throughout the Bible, justice and righteousness are synonymous with one another. But we need to understand as the people of God that if we are to seek justice in America, it is according to the standard of God's righteousness, not according to the standard of humanity or the standard of our society. So while we embrace justice, we reject modern social justice, and we embrace and seek biblical justice that cries out like our Savior, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God and his law is the standard of justice in the nations. And anything apart from his standard of justice and righteousness is not true justice at all. And David outlines in this psalm what a just nation looks like according to the righteous standards of God. In verse two, a just nation means that we serve the poor in verse two with justice. In verse four, we defend the cause of the poor and we give deliverance to the children of the needy and we crush the oppressor. In verse 12, that God delivers the needy when he calls and the poor and him who has no helper, he has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression, verse 14, and violence he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. God's people love justice because God loves justice. And we seek the needs and defend those who cannot defend themselves. We defend the poor and the oppressed and the vulnerable in our society because we believe that our God is just and he is righteous. And a just people seek justice and righteousness for all people. And that injustice is ignorance to God's law and ultimately sinful and evil. But we fight against injustice and we fight against laws and amendments like Amendment 4 that would seek to oppress and destroy the most vulnerable in our society, even those who cannot defend themselves in the womb. We love justice because God loves justice. And we love righteousness being proclaimed, not according to the standards of the world, but according to God's standard as it's found in his law. And God revealed his righteous law, both internally and externally. He reveals his law internally. It's what's known as natural law. 
that he's written his law on every human heart, that our conscience knows that there is a God, our conscience knows the difference between right and wrong, but he also reveals his law and his righteousness externally through the law of God, through the Ten Commandments. And it's revealed to us in his word so that we as a people of God in the 21st century church in America, we fight for justice and righteousness, but not according to what man says, but according to what God says. He has revealed his law to us internally and externally. He is above the nations, and his law is to be above the nation, governing a nation towards flourishing and prosperity. This is biblical justice defined for us, the people of God. But not only do do we see biblical justice defined in the word of God here in Psalm 72, but we also see the connection between biblical justice and a flourishing nation. David makes Solomon this promise. If you are a king that leads a nation to execute justice according to God's righteousness and his word, prosperity and flourishing will be the result. Verse three, let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills and righteousness. The mountain was symbolic of the temple of God. David was saying that the justice of God flows down from God in his word and flows down into the hills and flows down into the government and flows down into the nation. That a nation can only be prosperous if it honors the law of God and the righteous standards of his word. Verse 16, David talks about an abundance of blessings, an abundance of grain in the land. On top of the mountains may it wave, may its fruit be like Lebanon, and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the fields. David is making a profound connection between cities and the grass of the fields. He's making the connection between cities and the Garden of Eden that when justice and righteousness is proclaimed in the public square, that we are partnering and co-laboring with God to make all things new, to restore this creation to what, to what was in, it was intended to be, restoring and redeeming the broken places, the broken cities and the broken states and the broken nations, to be a better reflection of the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world that when righteousness and justice according to God's standards is proclaimed in a nation, we can expect flourishing and prosperity, the reversal of the curse. It's the idea that God and his law is above the nation. And what's interesting, we live in a nation today where we get so worked up by even the sight of the Ten Commandments in a classroom Not only are we not willing to obey the Ten Commandments, we lose our minds when we see it displayed in public. As if the Ten Commandments would bring a nation and a society some type of evil and oppression. When God's law has always been to be a reflection of his character and his righteousness, that when a nation looks to God and his law for direction, that nation will prosper and they will flourish. And nations that recognize his justice and righteousness in the public square can expect his blessing and his exaltation as Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 14. And in our nation in particular, our entire government and legal system has been dependent on a distinctively biblical ethical foundation. The Declaration of Independence itself has four clauses in it that appeal to God, that appeal to nature's God and the laws of nature, that appeal to the creator and the supreme judge of the universe. Hardly a document that screams that our founders were purely secular, but a document that screams that our founders understood the importance of including God and his law 
and appealing to his law and his standards of righteousness as they crafted the founding documents and crafted our founding government here in America. It was John Quincy Adams as president on July 4th, 1821, as he addressed our nation's birthday, he said, quote, from the day of the declaration, the people of the North American Union and its states were associated bodies of civilized men and Christians in a state of nature, but not anarchy. They were bound by the laws of God, which they all, and by the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all acknowledge as the rules of their conduct. Appealing to the gospel and to the creator God and to the God of heaven and earth as they crafted this new nation and the great American experiment, our founders understood that justice and righteousness of God must be the rationale and the foundation for their quest for independence that they did not choose independence for independence sake, that they understood that they were appealing to the laws of God and his righteousness in their quest to challenge a tyrant king and a bullying majority. Where would we be if it wasn't for men and women appealing to God and his righteous standards what would, this, what would this nation and the West look like with men like, if it wasn't for men like William Wilberforce and Abraham Lincoln, informed with a biblical worldview, fighting against the atrocities of slavery in the West? Where would we be as a nation if it wasn't for the civil rights movement in the 1960s, informed with a biblical worldview? It has been the transcendent law of God in this nation that has led to unprecedented flourishing. The West and America would be unrecognizable if it wasn't for men and women appealing to the transcendent nature of God and the transcendent nature of his law. We see here in Psalm 72, biblical justice defined. We see the connection between justice and flourishing. And lastly, in closing, we see injustice in a secular nation. Because of the fall of humanity, it has become human nature for us to break the law. We are natural breakers of God's law, and it has created a world of chaos and injustice. And in a secular nation that no longer recognizes the relevance of God, and our laws are no longer informed by the transcendent God and his transcendent laws, it has resulted in justice now being defined by the powerful. And justice And morality now is no longer absolute in this nation, but it is purely relative because where there is no transcendent law, there can be no transcendent justice. And where there is no transcendent justice, morally, morality is no longer absolute, but it is relative and it has resulted in a nation that is redefining again and again and again that which is good and that which is evil. And it has replaced biblical justice with a modern social justice movement that has resulted in chaos because a biblical worldview is no longer informing our understanding of justice. It has been replaced with secular humanism and cultural Marxism. And we look across the landscape of America today and make no mistake about it, it is a battle of ideologies and worldviews. Elections in this nation are no longer about two candidates or amendments. It is far bigger than that. We are facing a battle of ideologies and a battle of worldviews in our nation. Worldviews that are informed by the transcendent God and transcendent law versus worldviews and ideologies that are informed by secular humanism and even cultural Marxism. And Marxism in the West has wreaked nothing but havoc. 200 million dead in the 20th century in the name of Marxism, promising utopia, 
a utopian society promising justice only to lead to murder and to injustice and chaos. It has led to movements like Black Lives Matters that has sought to abolish the nuclear family and affirm LGBTQ policies and to fund the police. It has led to nothing but bloodshed and injustice and chaos in this nation. And we face the injustice on November 5th in this nation and in this state with Amendment 4. And we have an opportunity as the people of God to push back against injustice yet again with a deceptive amendment that is entitled Amendment to Limit Government Interference with Abortion. It is even named in such a way to deceive the people of God and people that want government to stay out of abortion. But listen what would happen if Amendment 4 in this grave injustice is passed in our state. It would enshrine abortion in the state constitution, permitting late-term abortion through nine months, well past when babies can feel pain, and survive outside the womb. It will eliminate parental consent for minors. My children go to Westminster Academy, they cannot take an aspirin without parental consent. But this amendment, if it passes, would remove all parental consent for abortion in the state of Florida. It doesn't define what a healthcare provider is and it will make of Florida an abortion tourism state. And more importantly, 40,000 babies will be slaughtered every year if the people of God do not stand up yet again against such a great injustice. If Amendment 4 passes in the state of Florida, the most dangerous place to be in the state will be in a mother's womb. God forbid we remain silent and do not stand up yet again against such great injustice. So what is our hope? Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in the Lord that the Bible says will deal with every injustice, who will deal with every evil, including your injustice and your evil and your sin. But our hope is in the Lord that the same Bible also says that he is steadfast in his love and in his mercy. The Bible tells us that yes, God is just, but yes, God is also loving and merciful. And the good news that the church of Jesus Christ proclaims is that God solved this dilemma of God's justice and his grace and mercy through the person of Jesus Christ. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ, the king who came, who was greater than Solomon, solved the problem of God's justice and his grace by taking on the justice and the judgment of Almighty God and extends grace and love and mercy to all who believe. And the reason why we at Coral Ridge declare that the cross is the answer in the midst of injustice is because for 2,000 years it has been the message of Christ crucified that has redeemed sinners and has redeemed and restored the brokenness and the evil and the injustice of the world. God forbid we preach another message than Christ crucified. Yes, the gospel saves us to Jesus, but that gospel sends us out into the public square declaring the righteousness and the justice of Almighty God. The cross is the ultimate solution to injustice and evil. This is our message and this is our hope that God's justice and his righteousness would be advanced once again in this nation and through his church. But what it means this morning is that you can no longer be silent It was in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, in the midst of the Holocaust, that a German Lutheran pastor by the name of Martin Niemöller chose to be silent in the midst of injustice. And at the very end of his life, he repented of his sin and he repented of his silence and he said this, 
First they came for the communist, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. But then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Silence in the face of injustice is not only ineffective, it is evil. It is evil because our silence as a church equals consent. And we want justice, but we want justice that is informed by a transcendent God and his transcendent laws. And we must reject all modern philosophies and ideologies that would attempt to seek justice in this nation because it is nothing more than injustice. We must, in the midst of a nation scrambling for answers, be a people that proclaim from the rooftops that there is hope found only when a nation acknowledges the reality of God and acknowledges the reality that that God has declared what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, and the people of God champion that message so that the whole nation knows that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Coral Ridge, this is our moment. Champions of biblical justice, champions of God's righteousness in the public square, champions of the only one that can make all things new. So let us, according to the grace of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, echo the words of the prophet Amos. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I pray that we would be just people because you are just, but we wouldn't fight injustice according to the ideologies and worldviews and philosophies of this world, but according to the worldview informed by the righteous standards of Almighty God. May we redeem justice in the city gates and in the public square. May we fight against injustice because you fight against injustice. May we stand with those who cannot defend themselves, the most vulnerable of our society. And Lord, help us to know that we have the message the message of redemption and restoration, the message of the cross. And if there's anyone here that has not acknowledged Jesus Christ, the one who took on the justice and the judgment and wrath of God so that we might be free, may you acknowledge that there is no hope apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins and be saved be redeemed and restored as a child of God. And may we, the people of God that do know the gospel of Jesus Christ and know Jesus as Lord and Savior, may we be champions of biblical justice in the highways and byways of our city and our state and our nation. And may righteousness once again exalt this nation And may truth and justice be proclaimed at the city gates for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer, amen.